Good morning, everybody, here in the lecture theater, and good morning, everybody, on Zoom. It is my great pleasure to be here today. I'm, I'm a little bit excited. I'm very giddy. This is the first international seminar in person that we have for, what, 18 months, almost two years. So it's really, really nice to have you here today, Michelle. Um, I've been looking forward to this for, for a long time, and finally, it has arrived. So today, it's uh, one of our named lectures. It's a quick lecture. This is a series that now is running for about... 10 years, 11 years, and it really is intended to bring to us uh, speakers that have made fundamental contribution to molecular biology. Nothing in a niche, but really broad, fundamental contributions. Uh, and Michelle certainly fits, fits that bill. So Michelle has traveled all the way here from New York. He is at Rockefeller University, where he is the Ralph Steinman and, it's a double name. Um, Oh, and Sanvil Cohn, uh, professor. And I believe these were the two PhD advisors that you have. They were co-running a lab. Uh, and so you were trained in macrophage biology and dendritic cell biology. Uh, and from there, Michel moved to Boston, where he did his postdoc with Phil Leder. So we could have crossed uh, strokes over there, except you were like 10 years earlier than I was in his department. Uh, and there you work on B cells started. I think the seminal paper from that time was the generation of transgenic mouse that had transmembrane immunoglobulins, and that showed for the first time that the transmembrane domain of the immunoglobulin was controlling allelic exclusion. That was very nice, very nice paper. Uh, from there, Michel moved back to Rockefeller, set up his own lab, and is, has been investigating B cell biology and also dendritic cell biology ever since. And all the peculiarities of B cells, uh, their allelic exclusion, their hypermutation by the AID mechanism, uh, their selection for high-affinity antibodies in germinal centers also has been investigated in Michel's lab. He has been honored for this work with many prizes, the Robert Koch Prize, for example. He's a member of the, of the Academy, um, of the National Academy, um, and has been training many people that are really important in immunology these days. So I'm looking forward to your lecture. Thank, Thank you for you. coming, Michel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felix. It's really, it's really great to be here, actually, and uh, finally, um, after two years, to be able to give a lecture in person. Uh, it's a thrill. <laughs> uh, so, um, as, as Felix mentioned, um, I'm not sure I have a pointer here. Um, my lab is interested in this phenomenon, which is um, <clears throat> the development of high affinity antibodies. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, this problem and the problem of um, the development of, of memory, uh, B-cell memory. Uh, and then um, I'm going to talk about the coronavirus problem because um, that's on everybody's uh, mind these days. And we've done quite a bit of work trying to understand. Um, you know, maybe I can use the you know, can, uh, one second. Um, Anyway, uh, we've done quite a bit of work on, on trying to understand memory um, uh, in, in this problem and in humans. All right, so um, we've learned a lot about uh, affinity maturation in, in the last decade or so, or the last 20 years, really. Um, and um, it's, some of it is summarized here, uh, where what you see are B cells in different colors, each having a different receptor, uh, being selected um, in response to an antigen. And B cells, unlike T cells, and really uh, unusual, they do something really unusual, which is to mutate their antibody genes as they're undergoing clonal expansion, so that uh, instead of having a monomorphic group of cells, uh, each with the same receptor, what you end up with is a group that's heterogeneous, 
uh, each differing from the other by small mutations of the antibody genes. And this is um, done by this enzyme AIP, which was discovered by Andrew Andy and Tasco Hanjo, uh, and whose mechanism of action was elucidated uh, by Christina uh, and Michael uh, as an enzyme that uh, makes small mutations in DNA. And then uh, during the immune response, uh, cells are selected uh, to have uh, relatively higher affinity from this group of uh, antibody mutations. And this happens in, in germinal centers, which are these beautiful structures uh, in lymphoid organs that are separated into two zones, a light zone uh, and uh, a dark zone. And uh, this pink stuff here is the antigen that's painted on follicular dendritic cells uh, living in, in the light zone. So um, my colleagues and I have been working on how this structure generates high affinity antibodies or selects for high affinity antibodies. Uh, and we have a, a working model, um, which I'll just summarize in this cartoon. So two zones, a dark zone and a light zone. And it's in the dark zone uh, that B cells divide. They divide actually very rapidly uh, and undergo somatic hypermutation. So it's there that AID is active. Uh, this is a very dynamic uh, structure uh, in which uh, B cells migrate uh, from the dark to the light zone after they stop dividing. Uh, and in the light zone, they meet the pink stuff, which is the antigen, and there they test the new receptors. So it's a whole group of new receptors being tested against the antigen, and the cells that pick up and process the antigen then show it to T cells, which provide the signals which drive the cell back down into the dark zone where the process is repeated. So you can imagine that uh, within a few cycles of this, you would have a selection for very high affinity uh, receptors. Now this, this structure has uh, two products. It produces both plasma cells uh, and uh, memory B cells. And we know quite a bit about uh, plasma cell selection, and in fact, it works just like this, that you get uh, relatively high affinity cells, which then migrate to the bone marrow. They're long-lived. They produce the antibodies that, have, that are circulating uh, in the plasma. Um, until recently, I think we knew a lot less about uh, the cells that we call memory cells and how they are selected in this structure. Um, and I uh, just wanted to briefly go over the work of a postdoctoral fellow who's recently published, uh, Charlotte Viant. Uh, what she did um, was to find a way of uh, labeling cells coming out of this structure. And she wanted to do that to study memory. And the reason she wanted to do that is because up until uh, that time, pretty much what people had done to study this compartment was to pull it out using antigen, so biasing uh, the findings to cells that are actually binding to with high affinity to the antigen. Okay, so the way this works is S1PR2, which is expressed early on, um, and a, a green uh, fluorescent marker. So uh, you label this compartment. Uh, and, and when you do that, you get an experiment that looks like this. Um, so uh, here you immunize with this HIV antigen core antigen, um, and follicular origin cells are neither uh, green nor labeled with the antigen, but germinal center cells you can see are both green and labeled. And sort of surprising was that the memory cells coming out are really difficult to label with the antigen. So that would mean they have relatively low affinity, and you can do this experiment at different times in the germinal center, uh, labeling at different times you always get the same result, which is that the memory cells don't seem to label with the antigen. So uh, you know, to understand this, what she did was to clone the antibodies from these cells, express them along with germinal center controls. And she did an affinity experiment first with FAB, monovalent interaction. And you can see that the antibodies that she cloned from the germinal center that many of the 27 here are in fact binding, but only one of the 41 in the memory cells are binding. So, of course, 
monovalent interactions are not what happens in the germinal center because the thing, the antigen sort of plastered on those follicular dendritic cells. It's almost like a polymer. And of course, there's a polymer on the surface of the B cell as well. So to increase uh, the relative affinity or the avidity, um, what you see here is you put the fab on the chip, uh, and this is a trimer, so there's increased avidity and some more of the antibodies bind. And now some of the memory antibodies bind. And then you can further increase the avidity uh, by making a trimer, and you can see that more of them bind. So in fact, what's in memory is not the high affinity per se. There are high affinity antibodies there, but they are not the majority. Um, what you get really in memory is, is a collection. A collection of cells that have different levels of affinity uh, and different sorts of receptors. So it's kind of, it's, like, it's a way of, of generating further diversity uh, for related antigens. All right, so that's a, a little bit of background, and now I'm going to talk about the corona, and this will come up uh, in, in, in that discussion as well. All right, so we started working on this uh, actually right away in January uh, when uh, the pandemic arrived uh, in the United States, uh, but we really were unable to get samples uh, from the Seattle group uh, until much later, and we had to wait essentially until it reached New York City, which was in, in April, and we had quite a bit of uh, coronavirus at that time. Uh, and so we began um, um, bringing a cohort of people to Rockefeller University, to the hospital there, and following these people over time, and we've been following them ever since. We've used two tools in order to study them. Uh, the first is uh, this um, antibody cloning uh, idea that, that, that we developed a long time ago, which was to uh, select individuals, take blood, and then um, purified B cells on the basis of whether or not they bind to antigen. In this case, it's going to be the coronavirus uh, antigen. Uh, sort them as single cells and, and reproduce their antibodies with the idea that we would learn something about their immune responses, but also uh, that these antibodies come from humans and so they might be useful ultimately uh, as, as therapies. The second uh, tool that we use to, to study this is a pseudovirus assay that was developed by a colleague Paul Binash, uh, we did together, and it's an HIV backbone uh, in which you insert uh, the SARS-S uh, uh, protein. Um, it has nanoluciferase built in, and so you get a, a really good dynamic range in this assay, and the assay uh, is comparable to the authentic virus, and here are a bunch of plasmas and the two different, the authentic virus and pseudovirus and monoclonal antibodies. So it's really uh, a very good assay. Um, and uh, we used as our bait to capture the cells, uh, the B cells, uh, the uh, receptor binding domain. And we did that with the idea that antibodies that uh, would bind to the receptor binding domain would have a pretty good chance of neutralizing the virus because this is the part of the spike uh, that binds to the uh, ACE2 uh, receptor on cells. Okay, so what we got uh, initially looks like this um, at the top. Uh, so um, these are uh, individuals that were infected uh, with the virus and, and recovering, and um, they each have cells that we could sort. These pie charts are uh, one for each individual. The number in the middle is the number of antibodies, and the slices represent clones, the clonal expansions that, that um, we talked about earlier. Uh, the colors are nearly identical antibodies in different people, and the circus plot shows the relationship. So you see clonal expansion uh, early on. This is about a month after a recovery from infection, uh, and you see antibodies that are closely related in different individuals. The antibodies, some of them are very potent. We tested them for neutralizing activity in the hamster model, which is a, a model uh, in which animals really get very sick, and we tested them for prevention before infection and therapy after infection. And um, if this is the control, which is the plaque-forming units in the lungs of these animals, 10 to the 6th, 
you can see that the antibodies are protective at, at, at relatively low uh, concentrations, and also they can be therapeutic. Uh, and this is essentially the basis for um, the therapeutic antibodies that, that are in the clinic. We learned a lot about how these antibodies work and what they bind to and, and what they are uh, from structural studies that we did in collaboration with uh, Pamela Bjorkman. So there are three, uh, essentially four classes of, of antibodies that bind to and neutralize uh, through the RBD. This is the first class. It binds to the RBD when it's in an up configuration. Uh, and it uh, essentially blocks uh, the ACE2 uh, binding uh, site. A, a second group uh, also uh, binds to uh, the um, ACE2 binding site, but can bind to the RBD in, in both up and down configurations. And this particular uh, example is one where the antibody is binding in two locations to two um, RBDs which are uh, just uh, next to each other, and it does that by um, inserting a hydrophobic loop into the neighboring uh, RBD. And what that does is to lock down the RBDs in a down configuration so that they cannot bind uh, to the ACE2 receptor. And a third class, shown here, here's ACE2, this is the third class. It's, it, it binds below uh, the binding ridge uh, and interferes indirectly. Um, and you can see that summarized here for the four different classes, class one and two. These two are the dominant classes of antibodies that people make. Uh, just about everybody makes them uh, and interfere directly. And these are the other two classes which are uh, more indirect. And what you see here is an outline of how ACE2 binds uh, to the RBD, and also in red, some uh, residues which should be familiar to many of you because they are residues that are mutated uh, in the variants uh, that, that uh, have come up. Um, and in fact, the structures explain uh, why the variants are in fact resistant to uh, some of the uh, antibodies that we have and also to the uh, vaccines. Uh, and you can see that here. So this is the class one type antibody. Um, and these two residues should be very familiar, 417 and 501. And what this shows is for several different antibodies and different mutations um, uh, that the neutralization potency against wild type is really very good. And this is in nanograms. Uh, but then when you make these mutations, this, this kind of antibody uh, becomes unable to neutralize virus. And for class two, same thing. Uh, here is this uh, 484 residue, uh, which is um, mutated in, in some of these more concerning uh, strains. And these antibodies are uh, completely sensitive to these uh, mutations. And because these two are the dominant types of antibodies, it explains why, in fact, <clears throat> Uh, vaccinees and convalescent individuals, uh, their plasmas uh, are less able to neutralize uh, variants that have these mutations. Now, it's not just that the uh, antibodies are, uh, have a difficult time with these kinds of variants, but they also select for these variants. And you can, you can show that in experiments. These are experiments done um, with Paul Binash uh, at Rockefeller, where you <clears throat> Take a VSV, which is, um, makes mutations at a relatively high rate, uh, and culture it um, sequentially in uh, one of these antibodies. And what you find, and this is actually an experiment that was done before the variants really came up, um, is, is exactly the mutations that come up in the variants. So here uh, in this experiment, 417 comes up, 501 comes up. And, um, the 484 mutation comes up against class two and class one antibodies reproducibly. Uh, so you can see why, why these uh, variants are coming up. All right, so uh, just to summarize that, the class one and class two antibodies represent the most abundant classes of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, 
they are sensitive to frequently arising viral mutations as would be expected from the structural data. The antibodies select for the same mutations. Um, and the class three antibodies are far less frequent and less likely to put selective pressure on the virus. So in fact, the combinations of antibodies to non-overlapping sites, as in the cocktail produced by Regeneron, uh, is resistant to many of these things uh, because in fact, uh, it tackles uh, two independent sites. And one of those sites, the class three site, uh, is uh, separate from uh, the class one and class two. All right, so we've been following these people uh, now for, for over a year. And this summarizes something about what happens after natural infection. So the gray dots here are the initial uh, IC50s in the plasmas of, of these people. And then we've looked at them after six months or a year. Um, and you can see that uh, each individual drops their neutralizing titers after about six months by a factor of five or 10. Uh, many people, so this is about, um, this is just two thirds of the people that we followed. A third of them are, have really very low titers to begin with. Um, there's not much of a change uh, after a year. It's a further drop, but not, not as much as the initial drop. Uh, and people who then get vaccinated do incredibly well. Uh, and you can see that in the blue dots, and that's summarized here. So 1.3 months, 6 months, and 12 months. And then people who are uh, vaccinated. Um, and the people who are vaccinated, uh, so let, let's just uh, summarize that for a second. So the plasma neutralizing activity drops by 5 or 10 fold uh, after 6 months, which is why um, you know, there's this recommendation to get boosted uh, after uh, about 6 months. Uh, the neutralizing responses uh, after that are fairly stable, um, and vaccination increases uh, the neutralizing response by about a log, or more than a log. Uh, and you get uh, neutralizing responses, in fact, to the variants as well. Um, so what happens in the, so that's plasma, what happens in the, um, the memory response, the memory B cells? So you can see here, after a year, uh, we can still see uh, the memory B cells um, in people who were naturally infected. Uh, and in fact, the levels of memory B cells are very, very stable. Unlike the plasma, these things just are sticking around. Uh, and if you get vaccinated, you can see that there's a huge increase uh, in the number of these cells um, for people who are vaccinated. Um, This summarizes uh, the antibodies that these people make. Uh, so 1.3 months, 6 months, and 12 months. And the colors indicate clones that are conserved. So there are clones that are conserved, but the gray ones are new clones. So something is continuing to happen in these people over a year after infection. And that's in all of these different people. And you can also see that in the levels of somatic hypermutations. So 1.3 months, six months, and uh, a year uh, after uh, initial infection, and continuing increase uh, in somatic hypermutation. It's not just uh, the mutations and the new clones that are coming up, but it's also uh, these antibodies are getting better and better with time. So, um, each dot here is an antibody cloned uh, from, from these people at different time points at uh, one month, six months, a year, and their IC50s are getting better and better and better uh, over time. And that's particularly clear here in the clones that are conserved, uh, where there's a huge uh, increase in, in, in uh, neutralizing activity. Um, it's not just their increase in potency, but they're also getting broader. Okay, so here, it's a little hard to follow, but these are different mutants of the virus, each here. And these are antibody pairs, 1.3 months and 12 months. So the same clone, but after a year. And you start out, this one is, um, this antibody is 
sensitive to uh, this strain, doesn't neutralize it. But then after a year, it, it does, and same here. This is the next antibody pair, here, and here, and here. Every single one, every single one gets broader. Um, and that may have something to do with this thing. So the initial selection uh, was for um, not just uh, affinity, but also for variance. Um, and why is this continuing to select? Well, one possibility is that there is just virus or virus junk hanging around. Um, and this is a picture of the gut. And you can see uh, immunofluorescence uh, uh, a couple of months after you cannot find virus um, in, in the nose or, or in the mucosa. So these antibody responses, uh, they evolve, they develop higher affinity, they develop increased breath, they continue to accumulate mutations, um, and there's evidence of persistent uh, antigen in the gut. And uh, this dramatic increase, there's a dramatic increase really in neutralizing activity uh, after a year, which may explain some of the exceptional responses of the convalescence to the vaccine boost. And they really are exceptional when it comes to the boosters. All right, so these are the naturally infected people. What about uh, people who are just vaccinated? Uh, and we've also been following cohorts of those people. And you can see some of that summarized here. So this is what I've already shown you, the convalescence. Um, after uh, one month is pretty much the peak of the uh, plasma antibody response. And you can see that this is messenger RNA uh, immunized people. They do much better in terms of their initial uh, response to the second vaccine. Uh, it's much higher than the uh, convalescence. But they too have a decrease uh, in activity after uh, about five months, which is about a log. Um, their activity against um, variants uh, is substantially lower than, um, than the initial strain. So this is the initial strain here after a couple of months. And the same people followed after five months, you get a decrease. And they're already lower against beta, against alpha, etc. The antibodies that these people make are very, very closely related to natural infection. In fact, you can see that here. In the circus plot, here are the naturally infected individuals. Here is Moderna, and here is Pfizer, and they're all related to each other. And they all produce very, very similar antibodies dominated again by class one and class two. Memory responses in these people are um, persistent. Uh, and you can see that here. Uh, the numbers of memory cells are, in fact, if anything, going up after five months. Uh, so similar, in fact, to natural infection. And somatic hypermutations are also increasing. But, um, oops, where are we? There we go. But unlike the uh, naturally infected people whose antibodies improve with time, there's almost no improvement here something we don't actually understand, even though they're mutating. Um, and you can see here in these plots that the convalescent individuals, they are uh, becoming broader, so uh, more activity against different strains, but the vaccinees really are not. So that's summarized here against all variants that we tested in the convalescence, the green is getting better, the vaccinees not so much. Um, so the messenger RNA uh, vaccination elicits uh, higher titers than infection, um, and they're similar to natural infection, and they decrease, again, by, by a factor of 5 to 10 after 6 months. Um, memory antibody, memory cells remain stable but the evolution is, is relatively limited uh, compared to natural infection. All right, so the last thing I want to touch on is um, people that are infected with other variants. Uh, and that's interesting uh, to understand a little bit about because of the idea that 
perhaps the booster should be with variants and not with uh, the initial. And so we've looked at some people that were infected with P1, that's the Brazilian uh, variant, which is very, very similar to the South African variant. The mutations are, are really very, very similar. Okay, so the first thing is that uh, when, when we do these uh, competition experiments here, and put one antibody on the biosensor, and you bind it to the RBD, and you come with a second antibody to see whether or not they're binding to similar sites. Um, here, the class one and class two antibodies are, are no longer dominant, uh, but um, many of the antibodies are class three, so a little bit different in terms of uh, the distribution of the kinds of antibodies that one makes. But what's more important is really what they neutralize. So here is the uh, P1, and here is uh, beta, the South African. And these antibodies are very good. Again, these, these are nanogram uh, level neutralization IC50s. These are very, very good against uh, P1. They're very, very good against beta, as you would expect but they're not so good against delta, and they're not that great against wild type. So in fact, if you were going to vaccinate with this, uh, you might not uh, get the best responses against delta or the wild type. Um, and um, you know, it, it could be, in fact, that these are selecting uh, for this, uh, for these other things that we're seeing, delta. Okay, so uh, the P1 uh, infected individual neutralizes uh, gamma better than, than other variants. Um, and it show that the antibodies elicited favor gamma. Uh, the target regions are the same, but there's a different distribution of the types of antibodies. Um, they're nearly equally active against beta, as you would expect, but they're less active against delta. Maybe, in fact, they, they select. That's, these are ongoing experiments. All right, so I'm going to um, just summarize um, what we've talked about. Um, we've been following cohorts of individuals uh, to try to understand what they do and, and how human immune responses develop in response to these viruses. Um, we've used the tools that we've used are uh, antibody cloning, basically, and pseudovirus neutralization assays. We learned something about um, memory responses uh, in, in these people and more generally in, in, in mice and experimental animals. Um, one of the things that's, that's impressive is really how different people make the same antibodies. Um, and um, that these antibodies represent, you know, classes uh, that, uh, whose structures help us explain uh, what's happening in terms of the development of variants. Um, and um, we learned something about the differences between vaccination uh, and natural infection. And there are lots and lots of differences, of course, that might explain this. Um, and something about, um, what people that are infected with variants do in terms of their antibody responses. All right, so um, I've talked about <clears throat> the work of a lot of people, really, um, beginning uh, with uh, Davide Robayani, who's now in, in Switzerland. Um, uh, and then um, people have contributed to the vaccine stuff and the infection stuff are also shown here. Um, there's uh, Vinci Wang, Alice uh, Ho, uh, and um, Charlotte Viant uh, did the experiments on, on memory that I talked about. Our work has been very collaborative on this project. Um, it's really a, a whole bunch of different labs have contributed in major ways. Uh, the Bjorkman lab, in particular Chris Barnes, a postdoc, uh, now at Stanford. The clinical group at Rockefeller, headed by Marina Kasky and uh, Christian Gabler. Uh, the VNASH lab, uh, the virology lab at, at Rockefeller, uh, and Charlie Rice's lab uh, as well um, have, have made major contributions. And in Brazil, uh, we were helped by uh, Marcelo Bosa and Andre Vale. 
thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michel. Um, since we have this mixed thing, we're going to use microphones in this room. So if you just let me know when you want to answer, ask a question, get a microphone. We also have questions that come online. Maybe we start in this room. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Michelle. That's so, so interesting and, and done so quickly after such a short period of time. It's amazing how methods have evolved to do this. I was very curious about the differences in the antibodies from the Brazilian cohort or the South African cohort. Have you looked at differences in other um, populations, for example, Asian? Um, and do you think there is a genetic component to the um, antibody initial response? I don't, I don't really think so. It's not just our work, but um, the South Africans have done something very similar um, to the Brazilians that, that we looked at and, and get very much the same uh, results. So don't think that it's so much the genetics of the population, but in fact the virus itself, which is eliciting uh, these differences. Um, which is why I say that if you were to make a vaccine that had that sequence, that you'd probably elicit the same kinds of things uh, as, as these people are making. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if, if there is a way or a vaccination strategy to increase the number of class three or four antibodies as opposed to the class one and two that are normally produced. Yeah, so, you know, one possibility is to use just the naked RBD uh, instead of the S. Um, because the, the class three and class four um, antibodies are seeing sites that are a little bit more hidden uh, on, on the RBD. And in fact, when people have immunized with just the naked RBD, they get things that are more universal. Uh, and the class four antibodies see uh, areas um, which uh, are, are more conserved actually uh, between different strains. So that's one possibility that yeah, in fact, Pamela has a paper, uh, it's a paper in science doing just that with nanoparticles. It looks pretty good, more universal. Hey, um, I was wondering whether the um, persistent virus seen in the patients, um, could it be that it's not longer the original Ohan strain? Uh, could it be already a selection of mutants? And that's why those patients develop the, the broad range of antibodies that are good against the mutant variants. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly, you know, one of the things that we think about a lot uh, is uh, whether or not the persistence of, um, well, the selection, basically, the natural selection of variants, which is bound to occur in just about everybody that's infected, um, would drive uh, the evolution of the antibodies towards this broader uh, range. Yeah, we think a lot about that. I just don't have any, we don't have any proof of that, but it's a, it's a nice hypothesis. Can, can you actually like study it? Can you check it like in those patients? Is it enough of the virus to check that? You know, there's very little there. You can see viral protein. You can get viral nucleic acids out, um, but nobody can culture the virus. Um, thanks. Um, sort of a related question, actually. Do you think that people who suffer from long COVID, there's something different happening in terms of the affinity maturation? Do you have like a hypothesis on that? You know, we have not studied any of those people um, that have long COVID. Um, you know, one idea about that is that if you do have a little bit of antigen left and you have a little bit more inflammation going on, that that and cytokines and so on make people feel not so great. Uh, so that's an idea about you know, why some people have that problem. Do, do you think there's a link between long COVID and this, I think, unusual feature, you know, of, of evolution of the antibodies over a year's time? So clearly still presence of some sort of antigen in the body? Or is that just 
I, you know, I think that the presence of antigen could be one of the things that drives uh, in, in some people. Obviously, this is a very heterogeneous uh, thing, this long COVID, um, and it's, it's, it's really not well understood, um, but I think that that is one possibility. And that, and that antigen that lingers around, is that in your dendritic cell friends, or where is that? That was in the gut, um, and uh, others in Germany, actually, Peter Mombarts and his colleagues have found that in, in the lungs as well. Um, but it's, it's cell-associated, I suppose, no? It's cell-associated, yes. It's in epithelial cells, or look like epithelial cells. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. So, Michelle. A terrific talk. Um, my question is sort of related to your last couple of comments, but given that you've demonstrated this long-term development of, of memory, and it may or may not be related to persistent antigen, and given that in the past vaccines have sort of been developed looking at short-term focused teeter neutralizing antibody, if you were designing a vaccine development program now, how would you, what would you be looking at as your readout for success? Well, you know, they're, 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 these two things are very different from each other, the plasma cells and the memory cells, and they have different, uh, they clearly have different functions in all of this. The, you know, the plasma circulating antibodies are going to be protective against acquisition. Um, and then the memory response, because it's there and because it's going to be a rapid uh, comeback, uh, is going to protect against hospitalization and, and, and serious infection. So clearly the second one is the one that's really going to matter in terms of uh, public health, in terms of the hospitals, in terms of overwhelming the system. But the first one uh, is going to be important in terms of just spread uh, and keeping things under control. Uh, so it would be nice to have those both readouts in um, evaluating uh, new vaccines. Um, and certainly, Something like um, the, the CHAD-OX uh, vaccine from, you know, we just recently started looking at that, um, really doesn't seem to be as good against, uh, in, in the memory part, um, uh, and certainly isn't as good in the plasma part either. So I think evaluating both is important. In the back, yeah. Hello, I guess, um, really interesting talk, also building off your last comment. Um, you've looked at the mRNA um, vaccine and how you have uh, evolution of your antibody response and improvement. Uh, do you see a similar result in live attenuated vaccines? Do you also have a stagnation in the um, affinity of antibodies through time compared to convalescent individuals or using live attenuated, do you see an improvement over time? Um, but well, you know, certainly for these various platforms, we're going to find out. It's a, it's a unique opportunity to find out about these platforms and, and for the future, um, which ones should be the focus. Uh, so we are evaluating uh, CHIMP, the Johnson, uh, and also combinations um, to see how that see how that does in both of these respects, both the plasma and the memory, and evolution. Gentlemen in red, send one from here, send you here. Really, really interesting talk, thank you very much. Um, so now if we, in the case of this happening again, let's say 50 years down the road, um, probably with the velocity, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, with the, with the speed with which we could get a structure, and is there any way that you can kind of predict some of the specific mutations that you'd get that would really change kind of the affinity of the antibodies so that you could give a first kind of response vaccine like the ones we received a few months ago, but then for a booster kind of have a mix of, of vaccines that will hit all the special targets and kind of a special cocktail. Is that something that would be possible? I don't know, you know, I don't know that that's, um... You know, you get, might get smarter than we would need to get, first of all, and, and really mess things up. So I think that if you were to design a vaccine now that had the South African or the Brazilian, that it would be a, it would be a screw up uh, because 
people vaccinated with that wouldn't get Wuhan, might not get Wuhan as well. Uh, so, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about specific design of vaccines as opposed to a vaccine that would allow better evolution. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I am quite certain that we're going to get something like this again. Um, but either allowing evolution or going for antibodies like class four, even better, that are to conserved areas of, of this thing. And, and that would get different kinds of strains. I think that that would be a better solution than to go for variants like a P1 or, or, or South Africa. Maybe I take one question from here first to encourage the, the online audience. Um, there's only one question here, and the question actually is, how is the immune response with mixed vaccine types? I'm not quite sure whether this means mixing two vaccines. Yeah, so uh, I, I, don't, I don't really know that from the point of view of the memory response, but what people have published is that uh, giving something like the, um, <clears throat> the Johnson or the Chadox and then boosting with the mRNA is really very good. Um, I wonder whether this means actually mixing at the time of, of primary. Yeah, inflation. that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but giving a heterologous boost seems to be fine. What I know is not fine is Chadox followed by Chadox. That is really not very good. What, what, what we are doing here? <laughs> uh, Why don't you start first and then? Um. Yeah, thank you for the talk. So I was wondering, so you used the uh, RBD as the bait uh, to look for antibodies. Have you looked at, in convalescent and vaccinated individuals, the different antibodies across the whole virus and how that response is? And also, is there any insight into how, like, uh, when you are infected, there's, is there a bias towards uh, developing antibodies towards that RBD domain versus the rest of the virus? Yeah, okay. So um, when people started doing this, they used the S protein uh, as the bait, and they would fish out hundreds of antibodies, very few of which were neutralizing. And those that were neutralizing were primarily to RBD. Uh, subsequently, uh, we have, uh, there's, an, there's an additional domain, the NTD, the N-terminal domain, which also um, can be neutralizing. Um, it's um, indirect neutralization by effects on the RBD, which is right next to it. Um, so we have actually done, we've gone back and done everything over again uh, with NTD. Uh, and NTD antibodies are less potent, by and large. Um, you can clone a lot of them that are not neutralizing. So whereas here, for RBD, maybe 50% of what you get is neutralizing. For NTD, it's more in the 15% range and much less potent. Uh, so, and you can understand that because it's not directly interfering uh, with the binding of ACE2. It's indirectly interfering. Hi. Um, so, he took part of my question, but I'll ask the other part of my question, which was, um, you focused a lot on neutralization of the antibodies, and I was wondering if you know of effector function, whether um, this plays a significant role at all, and whether kind of neutralization is the dominant thing, or whether there are people who have very low, say, new titers, but have high effector function. Yeah, so I don't know about that last part, but the effector function is important. So if you do these animal experiments and you knock out effector function, you do drop uh, activity in terms of protection. Um, there's also the possibility that effector, intact effector function may have negative effects uh, very late uh, in this process. So people who are given antibodies when early in infection, uh, that, that's really good. It prevents hospitalization and it's, it's a terrific thing. But people who are given the antibodies late, uh, there is some evidence that in fact you can see some enhancement, that it's not a good idea. Uh, like antibody-dependent 
like entry enhancement or enhancement of the the symptoms in terms of like associated there's, with a particular class subclass yeah. so there's both there's both clinical data and there's also laboratory data so there's this is a um, a collaborative effort with Richard Flavel uh, in which he's made humanized mice um, uh, and infected them uh, using AV to deliver uh, ACE2. Um, and there what you see is that if you give the antibodies late, uh, you, have, you have the accumulation of virus in macrophages uh, and increased a production of cytokines, uh, which would be expected to have a negative impact on the whole thing. Thank you. So, Michel, <clears throat> over the la over your career, career, you have worked on one of the most successful vaccines and analyzed the antibody response. One of the least successful vaccines, that's the HIV. So, why is why is the <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 so much easier, so much better than okay. the HIV? Is, is it only the mutagenicity of the virus, or is there more to it? No, there's, there's more to it. There's certainly the mutations um, in HIV, which is a very, very much more diverse um, thing um, and evolves at a much more rapid rate. That's certainly a problem. But there's a, there are additional problems there, which are the sites in the viral envelope protein um, that should be targets for antibodies are really difficult to get to. So for example, the CD4 binding site, which is the best neutralizing target on the HIV spike, is a, is a, is a sort of a narrow uh, cavity. Um, and CD4 that gets in there uh, is like a single um, uh, antibody uh, domain and not a pair like heavy and light chain. So for the heavy and light chains to get in there um, is really difficult. And they have to be super mutated and contorted uh, in order to get into the CD4 binding site. So it's, it's not just the diversity, but it's also the cavities that are susceptible to antibodies uh, in HIV, which are difficult. Uh, and that protein is just covered with self-glycans, and of course the immune system doesn't want to see self. So it, it's, um, it, HIV has made it extremely difficult for the antibody system for lots of reasons. Any more questions? Yes. Can I just ask a quick question? So in the in the in this this little interchange that you've just had with Felix, these elite controllers in HIV or even the super elite controllers. I, I should know this, but I don't remember anymore. Do they have neutralizing? Are they the rare neutralizing people or do they just have a better cell mediated response somehow early on that prevents them then from losing their cell mediated immunity? Yeah, so both. Okay, so most of the elite controllers are cell mediated T cell responses, CD8 T cell responses. But there is a group of elite controllers that also make these super antibodies. Uh, and in fact, the best antibodies, the ones that are being used for therapies, uh, are from people who have both, who uh, created antibodies um, that are uh, neutralizing very, very broadly and very potently, and have cellular immunity. So are they to that CD4 binding area yes, yes, that is somehow yes. magically opened for those people? It's not magically open. What it is is that the antibodies that they make um, are so mutated. They, so they have 100 mutations in a V gene, okay? So 100 mutations in a 300 nucleotide uh, span, that means you can change every single residue. Uh, that's how mutated those antibodies are in order to get into there and to avoid those glycans. Can I ask one last of question? You can. As many as you want. The, in the well, art, uh, you know, you alluded to, <laughs> I've just got one. I take you, that back. You alluded, in, back to coronavirus, yeah. you alluded to the idea that the RBD is somewhat, is somehow more open in, during natural infection than is available through the vaccine. 
Yeah. And is that, do we know anything about how that might be in terms of the pathogenesis of the infection? Is it dead virus that somehow, I'm just trying to figure out why the confirmation might be different to allow more of the type, you know, the three the evolution. class, yeah. Yeah, the evolution. So the evolution, I don't think it's a structural thing. I think that's a hanging around thing mm -hmm. or, um, you know, what was said a little bit earlier about the selection that's going on in an individual um, in, in mm -hmm. relatively, you know, two weeks of time. So enough that you get initial antibody response, it's not mutated, you do knock down the virus, but there's still virus around, and maybe selection, as opposed to, you know, an RNA which is just there and then leaves after a while it goes away, uh, or hangs around in, you know, on top of follicular dendritic cells. Thank you. Okay, I think I take a last question from here and then we are maybe probably done. Um, it's another question about uh, viral protein nucleic acid hanging around. Is that something specific for coronaviruses or is it something that many I don't viruses think do? so. I don't think so. I think that's a general thing. And it's known for, you know, for decades and decades that the proteins can just hang around on these follicular dendritic cells. They're not very phagocytic, and when they do endocytize the antigen, they tend to turn it right back around without digesting it. So that okay. antigen is very stable. Uh, do we have any molecular insight how these dendritic cells preserve such antibodies? Yeah, um, you know, Michael Carroll has done some nice work on this and, and how, it's, uh, how it's preserved uh, through um, essentially recycling uh, back onto the surface. Good for them. Michel, thank you very much for a fantastic lecture. Thank you. And I would just like to point out that we had 25 minutes of discussion. That is how much a need we were. Thank you very much.